Hi, everyone. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for people to enter the webinar. Okay, let's get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Seattle MLK Organizing Coalition's annual community workshop series. This year, we're holding 13 virtual workshops. This is workshop number six. I'm Katie Harris, and I am a white woman with curly gray hair and black frame glasses and I'm sitting in my home office in West Seattle. Before I introduce the panel for tonight's workshop on reproductive justice, there are a couple of housekeeping announcements. The first is that uh, this workshop is captioned and you can find the captioning on the lower right of your Zoom screen between Q&A and more. So press the live transcript CC button and you will have captioning enabled. This workshop is being recorded and it will be posted on the MLK Coalition's website in three to four days. And finally, um, at the conclusion of the workshop, I'm going to provide a link so that you can evaluate the quality of the workshop. These evaluations are very important for our future planning, so I hope that you will take the time to do that. So now I'm going to introduce you to Sarah Scott, who is going to moderate tonight's discussion. Sarah? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Scott, and I am a half black, half white, um, 39 year old, woman, and I am sitting at the um, New Freeway Hall in Columbia City, and um, I am a member of Radical Women and our Comrades of Color Caucus. This workshop is hosted by uh, Radical Women and Surge Reproductive Justice. We appreciate the opportunity to address these crucial issues as part of the Martin Luther King Day community celebration. Radical Women is a multiracial socialist feminist organization that has been active in the reproductive justice movement for um, over 50 years since we were founded. Uh, since then, Radical Women has fought countless battles for abortion rights for all women and pregnant people and against forced sterilization in communities of color. We understand that reproductive justice includes support for parents who are queer and of color, and includes issues like childcare, sex education, and livable wages. Surge works to end reproductive oppression for all people. Their work intentionally centers Black women, women of color, and queer and trans people of color for a movement that rises from the bottom up. Since Roe versus Wade legalized abortion in 1973, reproductive rights in this country have been under attack. 
Our opponents cloak their patriarchal, racist, and capitalist views and values under the guise of morality and concern for children. Our right to control our bodies will never be secure in a system that was founded on genocide, enslavement of Black people, and as well as the rape and uh, violence against Black and Indigenous women. Women who are expected to provide unpaid domestic labor, often while working full-time at minimum wage jobs, are the largest group of oppressed people in the world. And now that the Supreme Court is stacked in favor of the right wing, our right to control our own bodies is more at risk than ever. Misogynist politicians are trying to control our bodies on both a state and a federal level, and we have to organize on both fronts. Now is the time for a massive intersectional and bold fight back to defend our lives. In tonight's workshop, we will hear from three speakers on crucial issues relating to reproductive justice and what we can do to fight back against the onslaught of attacks that are coming. Their points of view include Jasmine Williams and Jazzy Bryant on birth justice and Tina Turner Morfitt on the need for the labor movement to mobilize for reproductive justice as a workers issue. Earth Feather Sovereign had originally planned to speak on the panel about the right to safety from rape and violence, but she had to cancel because of COVID cases in her family. We're gonna start um, with a conversation between Jasmine Williams and Jazzy Bryant. Uh, Jasmine Williams is a black childbirth educator, full spectrum doula, and a lactation consultant serving the Seattle area. Jasmine is LGBTQ friendly and uses gender expansive language. After going through her own traumatic birthing experience, she made it her life's mission to make sure that other Black folks exploring their, uh, excuse me, <laughs> exploring their reproductive options would not experience the same. Jazzy Bryant is on the staff of Surge and she's the owner of Jazzy Bean Doula LLC, providing birth, postpartum, sibling, and sleep doula care to the community. Like many intuitive caregivers, Jasmine has always cared deeply about everything around her. She got her bachelor's degree in society, ethics, and human behavior from UW Bothell. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jasmine Bryant. I go by Jazzy B. I use she, they, jazz pronouns. I'm a Black, multiracial, non-binary, fat femme with dark framed glasses, short burgundy-esque hair, um, curly hair, dangly earrings, and a visible Black shirt that says, save the drama for your mama. Joining you from my RV in Linwood, Washington. Um, like Sarah said, I'm the owner of Jazzy Bean Doula LLC, providing full spectrum doula support, doing birth, postpartum, um, sibling sleep and lactation support, as well as a birth justice organizer at Surge and a co-facilitator of the Doulas for All Coalition. I'll pass it to Jasmine. Hi, I'm Jasmine Williams. I'm a darker complected, melanated, cisgendered woman. I have short black coils, brown ombre glasses. Um, I'm sitting here with my children in occupied Duwamish territory, also known as Seattle. Um, I'm the owner of Blackberry, a full spectrum doula and lactation practice. Um, I am also the lead for the Black Perinatal Health Campaign um, through Surge Reproductive Justice. And I am also one of the co-facilitators for, um, for the Doulas for All Coalition. We, um, we wanna highlight the Black Perinatal Health Crisis. 
Um, I think that we would be remiss to be doulas and birth justice organizers and just black bodied people with uteruses if we didn't discuss what's going on in our communities right now around birth and reproductive um, experiences. Right now in our country, the maternal health rate for black birthing folks is, um, is irrefutable. It's like really, really dismal compared to white body people giving birth. Black birthing people in the United States are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related complications than white birthing folks in the United States. And this is becoming more and more mainstream um, and is being shared um, around um, different really well-known like publications, including the US Commissions of Civil Rights in September of last year. And I think in Seattle, we like to think of ourselves as like, and in King County in general, as really kind of um, exempt from racism and these sorts of statistics, but also like we know that our infants, infants born um, to black birthing people died at a rate of 7.8 per 1000, which is two times the rate of King County overall. And that is a King County statistics that is coming from the Washington State Department of Health. So we are not exceptional here. Um, and we know that these poor outcomes are due to medical and systemic racism, which black birth workers and black doulas are already working to address in their communities through non-medical ancestral healing practices. So we're not here to ask you to be any sort of savior to the black birthing folks in your communities, but to acknowledge that our communities have always been trying to address our disparities on our own. And part of the um, racism of the system is that we do not have access even to each other in times like this. We believe at Surge, um, and just between Jasmine and I, we believe wholeheartedly in reproductive justice and the framework of reproductive justice, which is an intersectional feminist lens, meaning that we believe, and I'm going to take a definition from Sister Song because we know we're standing on the shoulders of other folks who have already always been doing the work, okay? If you don't remember anything, I'm going to tell you we've always been doing the work to address what it is we're experiencing in our own communities, right? We just need the space and the autonomy to do so. Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. When all people have economic, economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about their bodies, sexuality, and reproduction themselves, um, for themselves, for their families, and for their communities, that is reproductive justice. We believe that this means that it's a human right and that is more than just about choice or access to abortion. It's about access to life chances. It's about access to liberation, and it's about access to bodily autonomy. Um, I want to pass to Jasmine to talk a little bit more about the history of birth work, where we've been, and where we are now. So I will actually start with sharing my own birth experiences, because I started learning the history of birth work after going through my own traumatic experiences. Um, so I had my first child at age 23. I was living in California, um, had a little bit of a difficult pregnancy. I had switched OBs because I felt like my first provider just wasn't listening to me and that I was receiving unfair treatment. Um, thought I had found an amazing other provider, um, but my options were very limited just because of my insurance and what it would cover. But was bringing up the fact I was gaining a lot of weight and was just being told, oh, that's normal. You gain weight during pregnancy. Um, I gained nearly hundred pounds in my pregnancy. Um, when I had my eldest child, I knew immediately after birth, something wasn't right. I felt like my uterus was outside of me and I was expressing this to a nurse who then told me I was exaggerating, nothing was wrong. 
I tried to point to the area where I could feel something hanging out of me and literally had my hand slapped by her. And when I went to go address it to the OB that was on call that day, she told them that, oh no, she's just exaggerating, nothing's wrong. So the OB didn't even check me. Um, immediately after birth, they were like, well, we think we're gonna, you're gonna um, have postpartum depression. So we want you to see a social worker before you can leave. But we're very much about, they were not gonna let me leave with my baby unless the social worker said I wasn't gonna have postpartum depression. Which right after birth, just a few hours, I'm still in the hospital, still receiving support, still have my mom with me. And to be told that they were already, they were already lumping me into the statistics. They were already making assumptions and not providing me with confidence in myself and my abilities to parent my child. Um, the evening that I was discharged, I actually had to be rushed back to the ER because they didn't listen to me and placenta was remaining and I had a horrible infection. I had a white cisgender male provider in the OR who didn't inform me about my options, who didn't let me know what he was about to do, didn't switch me to an operating room, just told me to lay back and started doing a DNC without anesthesia on me. My twin sister was present at the time during that and saw the pain that I was in, saw what was going on. We're now 35 and she still refuses to have children. I had my youngest back in 2019 at a local hospital here in Seattle. Had an amazing OB through my entire pregnancy, found just like the right person for me. But of course you never quite get your provider when you finally go into labor. Um, the provider that I had didn't really talk to me much. Um, the day I had went into active labor, I went into triage. She even said, today's the day you're gonna have a baby, but then came back and told me there's no better charge nurse for you. So I'm gonna have to send you home. Sent me home in active labor. A white woman comes in as I'm getting dressed and leaving out of triage. She literally points to the white woman and says, well, now when you look like her, you come back. And that was just devastating to hear that. And this is 2019 in a city that we think is progressive. And this is what's being told to black birthing people. My youngest child during labor, her heart rate started to drop to 30. She never have gotten that low. The provider and the nurse didn't say anything to me. The nurse was actually blocking the monitor so I couldn't see it. It was my mom who noticed it and told me that my youngest was dying during birth. That prompted me like, I have to push her out. And finally, when my mom said something to me, that's when the provider finally asked, well, how do you feel about a vacuum? How do you feel about forceps? Like my baby's heart rate is at 30 and you're asking me about a vacuum? Like I was beyond myself. Um, even when she was born, she had complications and they refused to take her to the NICU. They told her she'll be fine, she'll recover. It was a pediatric nurse practitioner of color that came in looked at me and was like, do you trust me with your baby? Because she knew I wasn't in the state or in a position right after giving birth to follow my child to the NICU. But I had to put my trust in this pediatric nurse practitioner and person of color to person of color. I was like, please just take care of my baby. Took her, got her the help that she needed. Now everybody pretty much knows my Riley. She Zoom bombs all my meetings. She was sitting on my lap trying to pull down my shirt to nurse earlier, but she's here and she's absolutely incredible and amazing. Um, but what I've gone through for both my birth experiences, I never wanted anybody else to go through that again. I looked at how I can intervene um, within this system and I found birth work. I found being a doula. Um, I found all the different specialties of doulas um, folks hear doula and immediately think we just support with birth, but doula work is full spectrum. We support with birth. Um, sorry, she's dropping french fries over here. We support with postpartum care, bereavement and loss, abortion. There's so much that we come in and we do. And for Black birth workers, I've noticed we're not just doulas. We go and we become herbalists. 
we become lactation specialists, um, sleep consultants. We really try to fill in the gaps that are missing when it comes to black perinatal and infant health. We want to make sure that our community is getting that culture congruent care and those wraparound services as well. But how we train allows us to focus on continuity of care. So you're always going to have us in your life. We're going to be there no matter how your journey turns out. But in that, most of the trainings that are really promoted to us are by white organizations. We've really had to seek out our own trainings by other black birth workers that are more seasoned, that are able to bring in our ancestral practices as well. Um, and in all of those trainings, they always bring back the historical context of granny midwives, how black women were brought in to birth spaces, how they saw how our babies were thriving, how they saw how our ancestral practices were. Thank you, sweetheart. I'm gonna put them over here. Sorry, she's handing me her french fries. Um, but saw how even being so disadvantaged and oppressed as they made us, that we were still thriving in our ways. We were supporting each other. We were in our birth spaces. We didn't need them, but they wanted that. They noticed how their births were declining, how their health was declining, and they brought granny midwives into their space. But with that, and just how we're seeing with certain organizations now, that they wanna to continue to profit. They wanna gatekeep, they create barriers that erased granny midwives that went from, you have these skills, we're going to write it all out. We're going to claim it as our own. And now we're gonna make you get our certification and pay us to be in practice. And that's what we see with doula organizations. They will exploit black birth workers work, how we show up for our community. A lot of the trainings say that we're not supposed to be advocates but our black birthing people need advocates, especially in a hospital space. They need somebody who's well-informed to help educate them so they can make informed decisions about their own health. On top of that, we need our own organizations and infrastructures. We have been trying to have a seat at their table and they love to let us have a seat because they love to claim our ideas. They love to to implement what we're doing, but they also have the money to back up all that intellectual property. They have the money to put the copyright. They have the contracts in the legal counsel to where they can form these contracts that really bind us to them and bind our work to them even after we leave. We give so much to them to get so little in return. And even when it comes to compensation, we have, organizations here that allow us to work with our community but don't pay us enough to sustain our practices and the biggest thing is we want to be in practice for our community it's not just about having a doula it's about that culturally congruent care having it as jazzy says having a doula that looks like you that's from the hood that speaks like you that's what's needed and those are lasting relationships can't tell you how many clients Jazzy and I have where these little ones are looking at us like we're their aunties that just know like, yep, you're a part of the family. We come in, I don't have to ask anything, say anything. I know how to come in and support that family. Those babies know how to come and just, I have a client who literally just hires me just to lay with her baby so she can get a nap. And that's how comfortable her little one is with me is to be able to do that. Um, and we need to keep those relationships going. We recently held um, our first year for the Black Perinatal Health Campaign through Surge. We had seven trusted community messengers, which are seven Black birth workers that are active in community right now. We conducted interviews of over, um, over 50 participants, all Black birthing people in our area and folks had doulas, they were doulas that went through their own lived experiences and became birth workers. Um, they all share their amazing stories and we'll be doing more community events where we'll talk about that. But right now I really want to stay true, through, true to their confidentiality. 
but just knowing that there is a lot that is being said, a lot of information that's being provided in regards to the harm that's being done by local providers, um, how the systems are built to where it's difficult for us to hold them accountable, but also them expressing that importance of having representation in their birth space, having another Black birth worker there, having a Black birth team, a Black lactation specialist, that culturally congruent care is so much of what matters to them and is what has made the biggest impact. When we say everybody deserves a doula, it's not just a doula. It's a doula that represents you, a doula that understands you. That's what's important. Um, and I'm actually... <laughs> I can keep going on about this, um, but I'm going to pass it back over to Jazzy to talk about more work that we've been doing in community. Yes, yes. It's so important to us at Surge that our processes are moving from individual blame surrounding experiences that shame around people's birth stories and what happened or um, so, quote unquote failures of their own body, failures of their own means, and moving that into the context of identifying systems that um, take our life chances away, right? Alleviating the individual Black birthing person from blame and identifying the systems that are causing our conditions and perpetuating our harm. And, and then once we do that, we can create solutions um, that are led by the people that are most impacted. And that's exactly what we're doing at the Doulas for All Coalition. We're trying to improve equitable access to, like, like Jasmine said, that culturally congruent preventative holistic care that we've always been doing. Our ancestors have always been doing. And we're, we are using Medicaid reimbursements for doulas, that system of Medicaid as a means to address access. And a birth doula in case it's not clear is a person that is a non-medical birth coach, a support person trained to provide physical, emotional and informational support to birthing persons during labor, birth and the postpartum period. And when it comes to black and indigenous folks and all people of color, it's also the, the person in the room who is remembering ancestral birthing practices because birth is more than a medical event. It is so much more than a medical event and we have medicalized it and made um, our doctors and practitioners owners over this experience. And we know from a 2017 study that if a birthing person has continuous labor support, that is a person that never leaves their side, both the birthing person and their baby are statistically more likely to have better outcomes just by having someone in the room. And over 50% of the births in Washington are covered under Medicaid. That's huge. When we think about that first statistic about our, our birthing outcomes, our perinatal health crisis, if we had 50% more people in our state having access to doula care, that would have a huge impact on Black perinatal health experiences. We know that birth doulas are not a luxury, but a necessity when it comes to advocating against medical racism in birth spaces and preventing poor outcomes for our Black birthing people and their babies. So this year, um, we are presenting a bill that will establish birth doulas as its own profession. We did not want to um, create that hierarchy where a doula is working underneath a provider in order to get reimbursement, but actually creating it as its own profession in the state through a voluntary competency-based certification pathway, which will allow for reimbursement. So voluntary means that if there is someone who says, no, I do not wanna be state credentialed, that does not align with how I practice as a doula, they do not have to get state credentialed in order to practice as a doula in our state. It is voluntary for those who want to get um, reimbursement through Medicaid. So only those folks have to be state credentialed and it's competency-based, meaning we're not gonna take the like main national doula organization, the main national doula entity that is white led um, for white women, for white birthing people, 
and say that that is the training, we're going to say that whatever training that you took, Black, Indigenous-led, ancestral, apprentice-led, if you've just been doing it, if you've just been doing the work and showing up for birthing people throughout the years and you have proof that you've been doing it, you can meet those competencies. It's not to say that you have to take the traditional trainings um, that Jasmine so like eloquently like flushed out as being super problematic and deeply connected to the eradication of our ancestral knowledge, right? Um, so it's competency-based and it's voluntary. And we want this pathway for folks because we want as many of our Black and Indigenous birth workers to be able to serve Medicaid-eligible families because we're so overrepresented in that. And we know that in order to address the Black perinatal health crisis, this is our call to action, folks. Address it in your own communities by supporting birth workers. Pay for your friend to have a doula. It needs to be on everyone's registry. Um, and also support Medicaid reimbursements so that those Black and Indigenous birth workers who are already doing the work of addressing the crisis in their community um, vote yes for Medicaid reimbursements for doulas this year. We're presenting it this legislative session. Our lead champion is Representative Kirsten harris Talley, with our second being Representative Deborah Intamin. So vote yes when the House Bill um, 1881 comes onto your ballot. Yes, it is crucial for the lives of Black birthing people, their babies, and the continuation of reproductive justice in our state. Critical. It's the least we can do. Um, so we really, really appreciate your time. I don't know if Jasmine or if little Riley over there has anything to add. We are a part of a generational process, um, but we so appreciate you listening to us today. All right. Thank you, Jasmine and Jazzy, for um, sharing your personal stories and um, shedding light on why the work you're doing is so um, vitally important and necessary. Um, as I mentioned before, we had previously had Earth Feather Sovereign, a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes and the leader of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Washington, as part of the workshop tonight. Unfortunately, Earth Feather is getting her family through a COVID outbreak and she could not be there. Uh, Earth Feather was planning to discuss how rape and violence, which are so common against Indigenous women, are attacks on bodily sovereignty and part of the range of issues included in reproductive justice. A stunning 94% of Native women in Seattle report having been raped, and they are likely to be treated as aggressors if they fight back. A local example is the case of a young Colville mother, Madison George, who was recently sentenced to six years in a California federal prison for killing the white man who raped her and threatened her life. Rather than being given the benefit of the doubt or sorry, the benefit of the right to self-defense, she was threatened with decades in prison, including drug charges, and ultimately accepted a plea bargain. Madison's 20-month-old daughter, already deprived of her mother for the year she awaited trial, will now lose more childhood years with her mother. This is another critical issue of reproductive justice, how mass incarceration that disproportionately affects people of color breaks up families. Prisoners should not be deprived of relationships with their children. The state's action continues genocidal history of separating indigenous children from their families and culture. Another key aspect of how reproductive justice affects Native Americans is that clients of Indian Health Services are denied funding for abortion as part of their medical care because of the Hyde Amendment, a ban on federal funding that also affects people on Medicare and in the military. Our final speaker is Tina Turner Morfitt. Tina is a retired public employee and the president of the Oregon Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. She has 45 years of experience in union and community activism. 
She has been a force for women's leadership in the union movement and believes that unions need to take up reproductive rights as a labor issue. And she is a mainstay in the national mobilization for reproductive justice. Welcome, Tina. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, uh, so um, I would like to, I would like to thank everyone for participating for participating in today's reproductive justice workshop. Um, I am a black, uh, medium colored, uh, retired 65 year old. Um, I have blonde hair today <laughs> and I'm wearing a black t-shirt with uh, our Coalition of Black Trade Unionists logo on it, okay? All right. Oh, and I'm also wearing glasses because sometimes I, it's, it's hard for me to read fine print, so, <laughs> okay. All right, so again, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's reproductive justice workshop. As I stated earlier, my name is Tina Turner Morfitt. I am the current president of the Oregon chapter of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists and um, the vice president of the Oregon Ask to Be Retirees chapter. I'm also a, an executive board member of the Oregon AFL-CIO executive board representing uh, constituency groups. My segment of this workshop will focus on the role of organized labor and why the question of reproductive justice is a union issue. Spending the past 40 years of my life, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the US labor force has undergone a significant change. I would know because I'm a part of these changes. As I said, I'm a 65-year-old Black widowed retiree who worked for a single employer for 38 years. I was married to my college sweetheart for 32 years. And my parents and my grandparents' standards, we married at the late age of 26 and began having children at age 28. I am the mother of three adult daughters, all of whom are in their 30s. My girls had the privilege of being raised in a stable, environment of a two-parent home. The nature of my relationship with my husband was somewhat out of sync with the rest of the working world from which we were raised. My husband grew up in a household whereby his dad was a civil engineer with a military flair working for the Army Corps of Engineer and the World Health Organization providing the family finances. His mother was a college graduate and a stay-at-home mom who raised him and his siblings. I, on the other hand, grew up in a union household whereby the framework of our family was sustained by my stepfather's status as a retired member of the Laborers International Union Local 261 in San Francisco, California. My mother, who was 17 years junior to my stepdad, was a high school graduate, stay-at-home mom, who worked, occasional, who worked an occasional job for what was referred to as pocket change at the time. At a young age, I understood the security of a fair union wage, the value of a retirement system, and most of all, the value of medical coverage as I witnessed the aging of my parents. As I cited earlier, my relationship with my husband was not the usual one whereby I secured the home and he secured the finances. In fact, things were quite the opposite and that he had a more pronounced role with the raising of our daughters, ensuring a stable living routine was at the core of their daily lives. This allowed me the freedom and opportunity to serve in an expanding and more diverse labor movement. The sum of my union activism was a direct outcome of the understanding, loving and flexible spouse and three affable daughters who were raised to understand the value of unions. During my work career, women were the fastest growing segment of the US workforce. A young female black college graduate who was a union activist was a scarce oddity here in the Pacific Northwest at that time. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, over the past 50 years, the period ranging between 1950 and 2000 the participation of women in the workforce grew, rose 
from 18 million to 66 million. Over a 30 year period, the life expectancy of women increased from 78 to 81. This increase can be attributed to the expansion of Medicaid in the 1980s, which created more focus on women's health care. The downside of this expansion were that the restrictions only included pregnant and low income women raising children younger than 18 years old or children who were disabled. Other medical issues that approved the life expectancy of women included the development of DNA testing to screen for HPV, human papillomavirus, which dictated early signs of cervical cancer, the sale of over-the-counter oral contraceptives to women 18 or older in 2006, which then was lowered to the age 17 in 2009, and the passage of the Affordable Care Act in August of 2012. The passage and signing of the Affordable Care Act increased screening for gestational diabetes, contraceptive counseling, and access to control, uh, to birth control and other family planning and maternity services. These medical contributions in conjunction with the civil rights movement, legislation promoting equal opportunity and employment and the women's rights movement resulted in more women working outside the home. These labor forces, these labor force changes were championed by organized labor. They understood the advantages that affected social, economic, and demographic changes for, in women's lives allowed them to remain single longer, to marry later in life, stay in school longer, the ability to seek out better paying careers, to postpone childbirth to later age, and to bear fewer children. These other changes facilitated my ability to remain in the workforce, allowed my husband and me to determine when to expand our family, and secured a pathway for me to return to work upon the birth of my daughters. Over the past several years, with the decline of union density and the more recent right to work upheaval, the survival of organized labor has grown dependent on the participation of women in the workforce, to be more specific, women of color who've answered the call. The inherent problem with, these, with this workforce equation is that for several decades, women have battled and continue to battle for equality. A more specific note of this battle has been the struggle for comprehensive and affordable reproductive health care. Women continue to fight for secure, improved, and increased access to quality health care. This struggle oftentimes buttresses against age old population control strategies and oppressive reproductive policies that undermine the rights of low income and women of color. Oftentimes members of organized labor have championed the liberal policies of pro-choice are not aware that the notion of choice doesn't address the needs of women or low income women, of women of color or low income women who lack the resources to, active, to activate legally protected remedies to address what happens to their bodies. An article entitled Undivided Rights, Women of Color Organized for Reproductive Justice, written in 2004, highlights this fact. The passage of the 2021 Texas law is a vivid demonstration of how the financial and social constraints impede women of color and low-income women in determining what happens to their bodies. In order to exercise their rights, they are forced to leave the state, but lack the resources to do so. It's imperative for union leaders to acknowledge the breadth of their growth. While unions have been supportive in the path of women's health issues, the time is now for them to pivot their focus beyond the, what lies below the surface. Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective have issued a challenge to incorporate other factors such as race, religion, sexual orientation, finance, financial, immigration, disability status, and environmental conditions as elements that may be roadblocks to achieve the desired reproductive health care. The overall goal is to acknowledge and dismantle the systems of oppression that make women's lives hard in this country and make it impossible to have access to the healthcare choices women desire. Their focus 
is to highlight healthcare reform to include certain uh, concerns directly relevant to black women, some of which include pre and postnatal care and fibroid screening. The time is now for unions to bridge their mission to defend the rights of all women in the workforce to tangible factors that affect their members' lives. Some labor unions have already begun to do this. In 2012, delegates of the AFSCME International 40th Convention held in Los Angeles, California, affirmed that women make up half of the American workforce and reflected that it was crucial that the labor movement continue to acknowledge the needs of reproductive rights. Most recently, AFSCME International President Lee Saunders voiced that the reversal of Roe would limit the full economic potential of young women who could be pushed out of the workplace to accommodate pregnancy or childcare. He goes on to cite that AFSCME International has adopted the, brief, the belief that stripping away this freedom will greatly endanger the quality of life for all women and that reproductive rights cannot be separated from economic and workplace rights. Additionally, delegates to the Washington State Labor Council 2019 convention, they were ahead of the game when they affirmed the passage of Resolution 31 entitled Resolution Regarding Reproductive Freedom and Justice. This resolution reflects that pregnancy can impact wages, benefit, and working conditions, which are workplace issues. Therefore, reproductive rights are worker rights. According to an article written by Mitra Tosi entitled A Century of Age, the US Labor Force 1950 to 2050, it is anticipated that the growth of today's labor force will be older, more diverse, more diversified, and increasingly made up of women. This projected increase of racial and ethnic diversity will make up the composition of the growth of the labor force in the coming decades, which is supported primarily on the population growth. A consistent element of the recent 2020 US Census reflects an increase in non-white birth patterns that supports this analysis. Women of color will dominate the workforce, the work labor force in the coming years. The time is now for unions to stand up and prioritize the issues of reproductive justice. The time is now for women to run for leadership positions in their unions, their cities, their states, and yes, even at the federal level. The time is now for women to join Surge, Reproductive Justice, and the National Mobilization for Reproductive Justice. Uh, the contact information for these nonprofit organizations is listed in the chat. I've also included in the chat uh, additional information about uh, where I got my information, uh, some literary information. So. In answer to the question, uh, is reproductive justice a union issue? The answer is yes, if they want to survive. Thank you. Good, thank you, Tina. Um, now I'm going to open it to uh, the audience Q and A. Um, so if you would uh, send uh, send your questions through the chat. Um, and then we will uh, we will call on some of those and have the panelists answer. Okay. Um, so our first question is um, from, from Emma, how do we build an intersectional movement for reproductive justice? So uh, I suppose any of the panelists who'd like to answer this question can go ahead. So I see at Surge, we've started in terms of our birth community as a whole. Um, we have leadership ladder trainings. So we have the UIR, Reproductive Justice. Sorry. And we also have Black and Advocacy. Um, 
but all the birth workers that come in through Surge wanting to also work with Surge, um, wanting to be more of the leaders within the work that we're doing as well. We have them take these trainings. It's great so that we're all, um, we're all coming into this work through the same intersection. Okay, you gotta hold on a moment. That we're all coming in through the same lens. Sorry, she wants to nurse. Um, that we all come in through the same lens. Sorry, Jazzy, if you could speak more on this. I, <laughs> Riley. Oh, Tinkers. Um, yes, so I think that it's like education and also space. Create space where people can come together um, and speak their truth. They might only be able to speak to their lived experiences and have a facilitator who can draw out the systems and the patterns that exist in the space and people's lived experiences, right? So draw away from individual blame into um, those systems to create and build an analysis have access to trainings like the People's Institute Undoing Institutional Racism. Um, Surge has a snack version of that as well as Reproductive Justice 101. Um, if you can't access those trainings, all of the resources that we and um, Miss Tina were dropping, if you don't look up Sister Song after this, you weren't listening, okay? <laughs> look them up, okay? Plug into and invest in invest in the reproductive justice organizations in your community, surge reproductive justice. We do not silo our donors. We pull them into the analysis because we know that funding is associated with all of the systems and the labor that is happening right now. So I would say like create space. The personal is political, right? Like talk about your personal lived experiences, connect them to the lives and life chances and systems that are disrupting Black and Indigenous people's lives. Believe Black and Indigenous people's stories and give them space um, for their own solutions, right? Like let, let us have our own tactics when it comes to addressing our community's issues and focus on the issues in your community as well. Okay, so it's not to say, I think people are like, let's center the most marginalized and that is so true, but that never means using the most marginalized as a means to an end to your political agenda. So I guess just show up authentically, create relationships, um, invest in reproductive justice organization, invest in doulas for your, the birthing people in your lives. Um, yes, and demand labor rights, right? Like if you're not listening to Miss Tina, like demand your dues, um, talk to the people who are also employed at your work. Make sure you are getting the same wages, if not more. We know our worth, okay? It start to like start talking. Um, it starts with like knowing where we're all at, so that we can build an analysis and a strategy to get us to where we're going. I guess from the labor perspective, I think part of the problem is that the needs of the many have outweighed the needs of the few. And being here in the North, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, women of color are definitely the few. And so uh, when you talk about creating an intersectional uh, uh, a movement process, you have to make sure that you're inviting everyone into the room. So what I would suggest is that you work through the various constituency groups that, that exist in your, in your arenas. Uh, work through your labor unions, because if you don't work through them and they are trying to get legislation passed, you have to make sure that they understand that, again, a simple, the simple um, discussion about pro-choice does not cover the fact uh, of what all of your needs might be. Because while we may maintain the right to have an abortion, uh, there are a lot of people who don't have the resources in order to obtain it because it's not just a matter of you just going in for a day appointment and, and then everything is fine. So again, when you talk about intersectional uh, movement, then what I would suggest is that you create um, a coalition that includes the young, the old, the black, the white, the indigenous, the, the, the Asian, the Latino, because every, all, all of us have different bodily needs 
And we need to make sure that we're addressing them all. Okay. Um, so there is a question in the Q&A. Um, how can medical schools, which probably are still predominantly non-Black, uh, non-Indigenous, be more accountable in changing the way they train, address medical racism, et cetera? What do you suggest for the community to push this? Maybe Jazzy Jasmine. <laughs> Sorry, Riley is playing with big sibling real quick, so I can jump in perfect to answer. Um, for me, I really see it being a change in curriculum. Also, when it comes to those teaching it, we need that representation as well. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to speak to um, a nursing class at the UW and talk to them about Black birthing experience, talk to them about collaborative care when it comes to nurses and doulas, um, even talk to them about how nurses can step in um, and positively impact the birthing experiences when they see implicit bias, um, when they see um, somebody that is explicitly showing racism or bias to somebody as well, um, how they can step in and make changes. And I think that's really where it starts too, folks knowing their power in birth spaces as well. But when we really look at how they're coming in, it really starts from what they're learning at schools. We need more curriculum that is representative of all of us. As Ms. Tina said, the black, the indigenous, the white, the Asian, we all have different bodily needs and we need to, we need to teach that. Yes. I think that students also carry a lot of power when we're talking about labor power. I'm like, Miss Tiano, channeling you right now. But like, um, students have a lot of power in how curriculum is taught. If students start to ask what medical conditions look like on darker melanated skin, the curriculum must change. I'm telling you, jaundice looks different on melanated babies, right? Like every mumps look different, chicken pox looks different. And if you, you do not have that education, you will always have racialized bias in your practices. So start asking questions for, um, in, in your like practice, right, about what it would look like on melanated bodies, what it would look like in a body with a uterus, right, because so many of those studies are conducted on like white cis men who are in college. And, and that's the basis of like, you know, the medical um, anatomy, right, and so like start complicating that when you are studying. Um, and I also like I'm a, this is something that Jasmine and I have talked about in other spaces. Stop calling ancestral practices alternative. They're not alternative medicine. Stop it. Stop calling it that, okay? Just because you're not learning it in your, in your school, in your practice, doesn't mean that they um, are not credible. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be referring to them. No alternative, no ancestral healing practices and practitioners in your community and refer out and to start build and expand on the idea of what a care team is um, and stop perpetuating hierarchies of care. Like doulas are not, underneath a provider in terms of like um, providing care. We're on the team. We actually make space so doctors can do their doctor job and not have to sit and console the emotions of someone going through a medical situation, right? And so like, we're both needed. Just like we would never say that social workers have no place in the hospital, we know they're both needed. Um, and so just disrupt hierarchies of care and stop calling us alternative, right? Like <laughs> expand your idea of medicine. And I guess from the labor perspective, I'm gonna stay in my own lane. <laughs> um, when I look at, um, when I look at this, this question, um, the only advice that I can give at this time would be that we have to be alert and aware of our uh, brothers and our sisters in particular who, who are uh, about, who, who are pregnant. And we have to ensure them that it's not a matter of just uh, shaking your head and acknowledging what the doctor is saying. It's a matter of asking questions and making sure that you have that communication with them. And if you don't have it, then it's time to find somebody else. And so 
Um, it, uh, I, I, not in every community do they have uh, the doula services that, that you ladies have, have talked about. But again, um, I think it's really important for union members to support each other, particularly those who are uh, childbearing age who are starting to, to, to have children. And so, like I said, I'm gonna stay in my own lane. <laughs> All right, we have a, a question from Helen. Um, uh, this looks like a question maybe for everyone. Um, what kind of threat is posed to women of color if Roe versus Wade is thrown out? Well, um, I'll go ahead and start with that one. I think we've already seen, um, it's kind of like a, Texas is, is, is kind of like a pretext of what the problems are going to be. As I said earlier, even though women still have the right to control their, what happens to their bodies, they don't have the resources to, to be able to leave um, after they meet that Texas threshold um, because they have children, in some cases they have other children that they have to provide care for and they just don't have the financial um, uh, ability to leave the state. Uh, women who are, are uh, more affluent they will always be able to, um, uh, to control what happens to their bodies because they have the money to do that. And so I think what, you know, when we look back and, and we see that neighboring states that still allow uh, reproductive services, you know, they, they get backed up more so. And I think it's gonna get even worse um, if something happens to Roe Ro versus Wade. And that's just the beginning. That's not the end, that's just the beginning. I think women are also going to um, uh, not, you're not gonna have as many women in the workforce. Um, and that's going to have uh, an indirect effect on young girls when they come up. And so. Um. I mean, what is not affected? Like it's, I think that also this goes back to what Jasmine was saying about like the history of grand midwives or granny midwives is that elder black women in the South have always been providing medical care to folks regardless of the law. So what this is gonna do, I think is also gonna criminalize um, folks who, who are providing medical care, who are providing that care and also make it more dangerous. Um, yes, so I think that that also, and, and also that like forced birth, forced pregnancy is the same kind of violation and harm as forced sterilization, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, it goes down the same legacy of, um, of just enslavement and forced birth, creating a forced labor force, right? Like all of this is so um, compounded. The rates of child abuse go up if you have a child who you didn't want to have, right? And then also um, criminalizing parenthood and how um, parents treat or relate to their children. It's like a complete loss of autonomy and it is, it's very dangerous for women of color, especially. And it's gonna increase the criminalization of women of color, I believe. Um, yeah, and potentially increase the separation of children and their families. Mm -hmm. Those are really great points. Um, we've got another question from Gina. Uh, thank you to the wonderful panelists, such powerful and important stories. In the Northwest, outside of folks doing the work, I have seen there is complacency from others seeing how urgent this work is. What are your ideas on how uh, to counter that and bring more people into this movement? Um, whenever you look at union work, um, it's, uh, the work is never done you have to stay persistent. Um, and again, you have to be welcoming. Um, you have to create tangible outcomes for everyone involved because our times right now 
um, and our resources were just pulled super, super thin. But what you'll find is the more people that you get involved in your causes, the less work that needs to be done by each individual. And so again, this is going to be, uh, there, there are always going to be haters that are out there. And so this work is not for the faint at heart. And so again, you really do have to uh, develop a plan and stick with it. And then uh, don't bite off too much at once. Um, but like I said, develop a plan with a lot of baby steps so that it makes it palatable as you uh, continue the struggle. All right. Um, we have time for one or two more questions. If anyone uh, wants to put one in the Q&A or the chat. Hey, Sarah, the other thing that I should have made note to also, so before you can answer a question, you have to listen to see exactly what the question is. You have to make sure that you're listening to whatever the needs are, because oftentimes we think we know what the person is asking, and sometimes we make the mistake of trying to answer the question before they even get it out of their mouths. And so, again, it's a matter of us hearing what the message is, and then formulating an answer that's not going to close the door before the conversation is complete. And so um, I have lots of friends who are a little more conservative than myself. And what I find at times is that I have to slow myself down in order to listen to what their points of view are before I uh, share with them um, uh, you know, before I can add to the dialogue of whatever the, the issue might be. And so, again, I would suggest, along with what I've said earlier, is that we have to stop and we have to listen before we just start automatically talking and trying to solve all the world's problems. That, <laughs> I'm going to do my doula spin on that because that really resonates with me. And I feel like that, um, there's this thing called like the fear pain cycle or threshold that doulas teach birthing people. It's to say that like, if you're afraid, you will always feel more pain, which could stall your labor and create a cycle that you're more afraid, you get more in pain, your labor stalls more, and you get more afraid. And then suddenly interventions are like, necessary because of how much fear um, has played a role. And I think that sometimes it's not about creating a sense of urgency. It's not about creating, um, yes, yeah, so it's not about creating a sense of fear or telling people that their lives are um, a part of the issue. I think that that's kind of my critique about how mainstream the Black perinatal health crisis is right now, is that it actually gives people fear when they're going into the hospital. So just telling people that they are in harm's way isn't enough. I think you actually have to tell people that they're safe before a conversation can happen, before they can get out of their own way, their own fear. Um, and so I think that's what resonated with me when Ms. Tina was saying, you have to hear people, you have to make them feel safe and at home and in community. So build relationships first, pull them into your life first, and then start to build an analysis and build a strategy with them. Um, and there's no messiahs here. There's no, I know the answer here, right? Like humble yourself enough to know that you probably can learn from that person um, and learn their history. And why, why is there black capitalists? Why are there black conservatives? there's a history there. And I think we like to point and blame and be like, I'm so embarrassed. No, <laughs> like we're surviving here. Um, and so many people and so many families have had to take up specific ways of survival. And first you have to just tell them that they're safe, 
that they're okay and that we can build a way out of this because they are still definitely connected to the most marginalized black person in our community, even if they don't wanna talk about it or, or look at it because it's so scary. So I guess just like meet people where they're at, like Ms. Tina was saying, and, and reduce that fear so that we can like feel a little bit less painful as we address these issues. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so some of the main points from the talks um, were that we need to acknowledge communities' efforts to provide their own healthcare practices that have always existed um, much longer than the, uh, you know, mainstream modern uh, medical establishment. Um, uh, Organizations need their own infrastructure independent of the establishment, and they need funding for independent organizations. Um, uh, groups like Doulas for All Coalition, who are um, uh, advocating for Medicaid reimbursements for all, um, and uh, we, we should look at the legislative bill and vote yes on that um, in the coming session. Um, for um, and for competency-based certifications, and um, and from Tina's talk, um, uh, there's an organization called Sister Song. Um, we need to challenge unions to include reproductive justice issues and defend the rights of women um, and people of color. And women need to run for union leadership. Women need to join Surge. Um, I also like to add that. Women need to join Radical Women, um, socialist feminist organization. Um, you, can, you can talk to me, uh, message me uh, to learn more. So um, I wanted to announce a few events that are upcoming. There is going to be a banner drop on January 22nd, um, 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock p.m. Uh, no going back on abortion rights, bannering for Roe versus Wade. And um, it's sponsored by Everett Clinic Defense and Radical Women. Uh, I'm going to post this info in just a sec. Um, there is also a study group uh, called Revolutionary Integration, Linking the Struggles for Black Freedom and uh, Socialism. And how can we get rid of systemic racism? What is the road to justice and Black liberation in the US? How is this tied to the struggle for socialist revolution? Um, the study group is going to be Mondays, uh, 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m., January 24th to April 11th. And I'm going to push uh, put the registration links for that and more information in the chat. Um, here we go. Um, and let's see. Uh, also check out reproductivejusticenow.org uh, and let me just paste that and then I will pass it back to Katie. Thank you, Sarah. So this concludes the sixth out of 13 workshops in our series this year, all virtual workshops. Um, and we would love it if you would attend more. I'm going to put the link for the workshop registration in the chat, along with the link for evaluation of this workshop. I want to thank our panelists for coming and joining us this evening. Um, we will send an email out which has resources mentioned by the presenters, um, and you should receive that within about the next 24 hours. So that concludes our workshop for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night.